All right, and I, I, he keeps saying. Okay, so let's see, we've got, I, I guess this is what it's like on a rainy day, uh, which actually amounts to like a, a mist, uh, actually. Uh, so look at, yeah, that's right. Okay, so here we are, look, so I've been, I've been trying to figure out what the best way was to structure uh, these last uh, five periods we get together the, of presentations to sort of uh, do four things, to accomplish four specific things with the structure uh, for these final few lectures. Uh, that uh, First, I wanted to be able to reemphasize uh, to you in these final lectures just how bad things really are uh, environmentally with regard to the, glo the global climate change, uh, constitutionally in light of the makeup of the federal courts uh, and the kind of rulings that they've been doing, and politically in light of the sort of uh, bankrupt uh, nature of the Republican and Democratic Party. Uh, but number two, at the same time, uh, be able to uh, make it clear to you that there's every reason to be realistically optimistic about the fact that we have the ability <clears throat> to keep this all from happening. The worst possible uh, case scenario of what's rolling into place right now. Uh, given, given the degree of freedom that we still have and the particular constitutional system that we have. Uh, so that we, we have the capacity to fix this uh, still. I'm not uh, part of that uh, community that believes that we've passed the tipping point, that there's no possible way of uh, salvaging uh, the, uh, what, what they call the cascading event uh, that's going to happen with regard to the collapse of our, of our uh, global climate, et cetera. And uh, in, given my 45 years of experience in being able to do cases and projects that have actually succeeded, in getting something done that nobody thought could get done, uh, I wanted to be able to, in these last uh, handful of, uh, of lectures, communicate to you that sense of optimism uh, in, in the face of things even as bad as they really are. Uh, and I also wanted to be able to provide you with uh, a clear set of, uh, of academic and scholastic Information and material, in reading materials, etc., so that you're so that you're actually uh, getting your money's worth uh, in light of the increased uh, tuitions uh, for for a whole class like this for ten full weeks. That you're actually uh, improving your academic uh, credentials uh, in addition to just having one particular uh, class more to put on your resume. Uh, and fourthly, I wanted to be able to, in these, these last few presentations, to be able to uh, identify for you specific issues that you might want to address uh, in doing your 15-page paper, your final 15-page paper. Uh, and so, so, but what I first, what I first tried to do is I, I tried to go over kind of a comprehensive uh, presentation, what a comprehensive presentation of my thesis is on what is going on, dividing it up into certain sub-theses, uh, and uh, I, I wanted to try to figure out how to divide that all up into uh, 58 separate uh, mini-theses, uh, so that I could then have one for each of you to actually work on. And I had this great scheme figured out where what we would do is we would average your two the grades on your two essays in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a descending order of what your grade point average was. Uh, you'd be given an opportunity to pick one of them. Uh, and so that the, in the so, but, but when I got really working on that whole thing, I said that's probably not a fair thing to do. Uh, and, and besides, it was, uh, I thought that, that by, by having you get, in a sense, assigned, even though you get to pick one uh, of one of these 58 topics, it would be way too narrow, a lot more narrow in its focus than what I wanted you to be able to get out of the class. So even my great scheme of having a whole stack of you know, 57 
other uh, essays besides your own to carry around with you for the rest of your life uh, to consult when you were asked questions at cocktail parties and stuff about this issue. Uh, that, that I said, no, that's, that's probably not the way to, to do this. And what, I, what I've decided to do, and, and here are, here are. Uh, We're not going to make a file No, no, here, here's, the fir here's the first 30 of the topics that I was going to assign to you. Uh, and, and I decided that instead what I would do is uh, I'm going to, in, in these, these last few lectures, I'm going to present to you the kind of uh, full scale thesis that I have uh, about what's going on, what's going to be going on in the rest of your life, uh, what the issues are, what the factors are that are involved that you have at your disposal to attempt to address it, etc. And that I'll, I'll get this all laid out to you. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you in your final essay for you to tell me what your thesis is. You know, about uh, really what it is that's uh, going on right now, how you understand what's going on in the world right now, what you anticipate is going to be happening in the next 30 years or so of your life, uh, uh, what it is that you plan to do in your life professionally, uh, to the degree to which you've had any kind of general ideas about what that might be, and how you think that might relate to whatever it is you can do to try to contribute to stopping this particular uh, crisis from befalling uh, all of us. Uh, and, that, uh, and then I wanted you to be able to, well, I want you to be able to say, you know, how it is that you think the Constitution of the United States and the entire way in which our government is set up under the Constitution uh, relates to how it is that you intend to do something about this, uh, you know, and in the, in the, I'm 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 not anticipating many essays that are going to be like, I plan to be a shoe salesperson my whole life, and uh, none of this has anything to do with me, uh, in that I think the Constitution is a ship that sits in the harbor in Boston. Uh, so I'm I'm anticipating that you'll take this seriously. You'll try to. Uh, I want this to be a genuine. Uh, a learning experience for you so that in doing this final essay you can actually apply yourself to thinking uh, not only about the materials that we've covered and what it is I say about my particular thesis so you'll have some idea of what that looks like uh, about how one might go about elucidating uh, your own thesis about what's going on uh, but that it would, it would also help guide you toward what it is you think the Constitution has to do with any of this and how it might relate to you. So uh, I've decided on this latter of the two uh, options so that, that you'll really be able to direct your attention in the 15-page essay. You know, I, don't, I don't want, I don't, if, if you could help it, please, I don't want like eight and a half pages wide-spaced then with just footnotes for the rest of it or references or a bibliography or anything. I want, I want you to have uh, uh, adequate space within these 15 pages to actually uh, take a pass at your thesis and telling, telling me what it is you think uh, is going on and what's going to be going on and what uh, can be done about it and how you intend, if at all, to participate in it and how that all relates to the Constitution in this class. Okay? So what, what I want to do is I want to start today and... Uh, well, well, no, no, it, it, isn't, it isn't that you don't support what your thesis uh, is with any of the information from the course or from the readings. You've got lots of different readings that I've uh, shown you, uh, and you've, you've got uh, uh, connections to it through the, through the websites. Uh, you know, so that, that I want you to support your thesis. You know, I mean, I'm not just asking you to pull something out of the sky saying, here, you know, I think that... Uh, you know, we're going to be invaded by Martians and we're all going to be turned into food. You know, I mean, and then say, there, that's it. You know, I, I expect you to utilize the resources that we've made available during the course uh, and, uh, and, uh, and do some uh, additional research to art articulate your views in what you think. Okay? So, so what I want to do is I want to start out by uh, the, the, my, my thesis is I've, I've tried to, uh, instead of 
breaking it down into 58 different subcomponents and assigning one for each of you. Uh, what I've done is I've, I've uh, start, started to lay it out and uh, I believe that there's going to end up being, by the time I get done doing all the notes on it, probably about 10 or so uh, major sub-theses to it. But the, <clears throat> but the overall the overall thesis of what I'm uh, attempting to communicate to you in this particular case is that there exists, right at the present moment, uh, a, uh, and, and there has existed ever since the beginning of kind of self-conscious Western civilization, uh, dating all the way back to the pre-Socratics uh, in Greece and even earlier uh, into Mesopotamia, there has always been uh, an elite uh, group of uh, individual human beings uh, who have, in fact, been uh, ruling from the shadows. Uh, and that they, uh, they are effective in superimposing their will uh, on whatever the public structures are uh, of the community governance system, uh, and that through that process, they have been imposing their will uh, on the public policies of the various uh, political communities in Western culture, uh, and in imposing their views on the remaining 99.99% of us. Uh, and, it, and it's not a group that constitutes a full 1%. Uh, as the bumper stickers go now. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more uh, refined group, much more uh, restricted uh, group. Uh, and that this, the, 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 my thesis is that the activities of this particular elite uh, group in its manifestation at the present time is in fact uh, made up of the key owners of the majority of the, of the shares of stock in uh, maybe a dozen or so, uh, or maybe a little more than that, major corporations, transnational uh, corporations, uh, business corporations, uh, that are in fact engaged in a set of activities, which I'll go into in more detail. Uh, in the course of the, the next few lectures, uh, that they're engaged in activities which are, in fact, causing the, the massive uh, uh, influx of global greenhouse house gas emissions into our atmosphere and are drastically uh, damaging and disrupting the natural flow of our climate system on the planet. And that this, this uh, process is endangering the stability uh, of our, our global economy. It's uh, threatening the uh, civil liberties and stability of our, of our communities. And that in, in, in fact, if left unchecked, uh, it's going to basically so disrupt our social structures, political structures and economic structures, that it's going to generate major chaos on the planet uh, during the course of your adult lives and uh, indeed during the course of the remainder of my life, which I'm projecting in about maybe another 30 years or so. Uh, you, guys, you guys have more than 30 years in front of you. You guys basically have about 70 years or more uh, in front of you. Uh, and that, that I believe that this, this calamity is going to be taking place uh, if left uh, uh, the process is left unchecked within the course of both of our lifetimes. So that I see this happening within the next 30 years rather than over the next 70 years. Uh, and that, uh, and that the, the fact is that in order to stop this catastrophe from taking place, it is going to require uh, the undertaking of a set of very radical actions in order to stop it. <clears throat> because as presently designed and functioning, our economic and political system is not in fact 
uh, designed to or even intended to uh, stop them from doing things like this. Uh, that, that, that it is so uh, distorted and, uh, and crafted to facilitate the uh, short-term profit-making objectives uh, of the corporations and their owners of their stock, uh, that in fact it is blind to the social, political, and economic consequences uh, of their own actions. And so therefore, there is going to have to be some type of a very radical set of interventions on our part uh, in order to stop this catastrophe from happening. And that uh, it, is, it is also uh, uh, one of the sub-theses that I'll, I'll be going through here uh, is that, uh, that this oligarchy, this elite oligarchy, has at its disposal the ability to control and direct the activities of the major national security state bureaucracies that it has put into place that are armed and dangerous and that they will in fact be effective in attempting to suppress uh, these radical actions, uh, these radical interventions that would need to be undertaken uh, under the guise of having to protect the law and order of this particular system that has been designed uh, in cooperation with this oligarchy to foster and to promote their own interests. Yes? Yeah, I've, I've, I've mentioned in the past, one, one of the best uh, resources for this is uh, Gene Sharp's uh, three-volume uh, study that was done at Harvard University on nonviolent action. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a great in-depth analysis of the principles that are involved, how, how different people at different times have made use of the, the political and constitutional uh, vehicles that are available to them. Uh, and what, what, uh, what I want to do is I want to b go through the 10 or so subcomponent elements of this thesis that I'm uh, going to be talking with you about uh, because I want you to see and understand and appreciate the fact that it is possible to actually deal with this crisis that is coming but I want you to be clear about the reality of this crisis and how serious and catastrophic it's going to be but for uh, our intervention. Yes, Sophia. I have a scientific question though. I've heard it, all right, so I have heard it said that at this point, even if we stopped all emissions, we really couldn't stop climate change or I mean, so, I mean, again, you hear all of these geoengineering schemes being proposed. Yep. Um, and if we're really at that level of desperation, while obviously powers that be need to be taken down, I'm just wondering if this will in any way be effective regarding climate. Well, that's, that, is, that is one of the questions I want to deal with. Because as, as I'm saying, I... The part of my thesis that I want to present to you is that I do not believe that we have reached that tipping point yet. I don't believe that we've reached the point where we have uh, crossed the point of no return and that the cascading event, as they refer to it, is absolutely unavoidable. And so I want to be able to be discussing that because part of your thesis uh, as to what you think is happening or what is going to happen has to do with your ability to research this question and to look at the various positions that have been taken and to determine whether you're persuaded uh, that in fact we're so far gone uh, on, this, uh, on this path that there's no really uh, avoiding the massive catastrophe 
Uh, and if so, therefore, what do you propose doing? Uh, and if you don't believe that we're past that point, uh, then what do you think uh, ought to be done? And what do you think can be done? Uh, and what is your position with regard to doing these things within the thesis that I'm going to be uh, proposing is that this can be accomplished through nonviolent means, that uh, it can be undertaken without resorting to the use of ad hominem violence against the particular owners and managers of these corporations, uh, without having to have a violent clash with the armed forces of the federal, state, and local uh, governments. Uh, and so that, but I want you to reflect upon this. I'm not asking you to simply endorse the particular thesis that I have. You may in fact be convinced that without the use of at least some anti-materiel actions, uh, that we're basically whistling past the graveyard. Uh, and that we're kidding ourselves, that we're really going to be able to persuade them through peaceful means uh, to turn this course around. But that's what I'm, I'm attempting to solicit from you, is what your thesis is with regard to all of this. Your thesis may be that you don't really believe that the uh, global climate change is as serious as others say. You may not... You may, in fact, be believers that this is all just nothing more than a part of a, a normal cycle of, uh, of climate change that occurs by nature. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of things that you could believe, and I'm perfectly prepared to be respectful of whatever your thesis is, as long as it's adequately supported uh, and, uh, and sincerely set forth. But I, I want to get a, a sense of the cross-section of the, the community here uh, of what you believe uh, about the, the, this particular issue uh, with regard to the global climate change and the onrush of the major national security state apparatus uh, that, uh, that I'm going to hypothesize uh, is going to be uh, put into operation to try to suppress uh, any effective uh, radical change, uh, so that so that that's the that's the overall major thesis that I want to uh, propose, uh, and the uh, key to this thesis is this. Yes, Tyler. Yeah. Well, you can get you can do longer if you'd like. You can. No, no. What, 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 what this is like, Tyler, is like that, that if, you're, if you're in front of the United States Supreme Court and you've only got eight minutes to make your presentation and you've got a case that's as complex as Brown versus the board having to do with racial segregation and the history of, of racism in the country and the kind of adverse psychological effects and impacts upon children by being racially segregated, you can't cover everything. But what you have to try to do is to discipline yourself within the 15 to 50 pages or whatever it is that you want to use to articulate your thesis. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to do it, to actually formulate a thesis on this uh, and, and bolster it as best as you can because I believe that this is a great opportunity while you're here in the process of educating yourself to look to what the kind of issues are that you'd like to look into, how much you can look into it given the, the uh, period of time that we have remaining, uh, and how well you can begin to formulate, push your thinking beyond where it may be already. That, that's the objective of this. Okay? Now, as, as you can see, that one, of the, one of the fundamental premises or sub-premises of this thesis is that there does exist this elite oligarchy uh, that in fact, as I say, rules from the shadows uh, and does in fact superimpose their will upon the public institutions. Uh, and no matter how democratic appearing these institutions are, they are in fact subject to this type of behind the scenes manipulation. Uh, and I want to, uh, I'm going to be talking about that and you may not agree with that. 
uh, and that you're, you're not only free, but you're invited to disagree with that if you do disagree with that. Uh, and you can counter that with what your theory is as to what the problem is, as to why this is happening. Yes, Sammy. Well, I was that, that's what I was I was thinking about that, but the, 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 the problem is that I'm not I'm not sure what, what's what's actually happened is I got approached by three or four people and and uh, without naming names, it became obvious to me that what people were doing is dealing with subjects they'd already dealt with in some other class and they'd say, oh here, why don't I just tell you about you know like the history of racial prejudice in the United States or uh, you know, another th thing, a paper they did for economics. And all I'm saying is I'm trying to get you to do something here that is a little bit more directed, but the fact of the matter is asking you to set forth your whole thesis uh, as to what's going to be going on in the world and how it relates to the Constitution and how the Constitution might be effective in helping you do something about what you think is going on in the world is a pretty broad topic. So that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get from you, and Sophia will tell us how to do that. <laughs> well, actually, I did, I was going to express my issue with the prompt change as well, um, which was I loved the idea of being able to have a compendium of all of our research on all of these different topics that seemed good, that seemed like a really valuable guide to the real world that we could take out with us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I feel like just articulating our own worldview that we already believe is really not going to give us as much as seeing what everybody else has written with their research. So I like that idea. Now, and here's the other question. Well, but the, the fact is, I'm not, I'm not opposed to making everybody else's papers available to each of you. So, I mean, the, you can have a compendium of exactly what the thesis is that each of the other students in the class has and what their opinion is about what's getting ready to happen during the course of your lives, you know, what, what role they intend to play, if any, in doing something about it. All of that strikes me as being of some significant value as well. Yes, uh, so I'm just saying, I, I almost feel like we should have a choice between the two prompts because there's, sorry, I know, we're wasting class time here, but I mean, it's just that, I mean, I feel like we, what you're suggesting right now is one topic, and it's pretty narrow. Um, and then the, and I, I'm so sorry for asking this, but um, my one other thing is, is this, is the prompt change some kind of a meta thing you're doing? I'm noticing that everybody here that has so far raised their hand has had some issue with the prompt and are you trying to get us to mobilize against your prompt suggestion to, te to teach us how to mobilize against something we don't like? I d all, all right, all right, you caught me. No, no, the, no. What it, what it, what it, I'm sorry. no, no, no. What it, what it is, no, what it, what it is, is that what I, what I've, what I've, in, in working the way through here to try to figure out specific issue areas where you could do kind of deep drill down and do kind of these these 58 different papers about a particular sub uh, sub subject uh, and then give you all of these things as a big compendium struck me as really going to be requiring a lot more kind of original research on your part than I thought that it was really fair to impose upon you here uh, right toward the end of the course. And I wanted to give you a chance to be much more creative in, in pushing your own thinking beyond where it is so far. Uh, based upon the kind of things that you've uh, come to know already in the course and the, th the pr presentation I'm going to be making in the next few sessions so that you'll have a particular thesis in a certain sense to respond to. Not by saying that you have to go through it in detail and agree with it or disagree with it, but it, it, it demonstrates to you what a comprehensive thesis looks like. Uh, and if, uh, if I do well enough in the presentation, you'll get an idea of how you might do a similar presentation 
completely different, perhaps, based upon your different beliefs or understandings. But I want you to be able to do that. I want you to have an opportunity, uh, and, and I'm not denigrating any other courses you've ever taken, but a, an opportunity in at least one course in your undergraduate career to really break out and get to the edges of your own thinking and think about the rest of your life, what it is you think is really going to be happening on a major scale in, in the world, and what, if anything, you plan to do to participate in addressing it. You know, now that, that seems to me to be a, a kind of an ideal opportunity uh, for self-education. So that, that's why uh, I'm here at that point. Uh, and so the answer would be no. Uh, with regard to saying, here, let's do a different prompt or, or go del delving down into some sub piece of information in the course and write a paper about just that uh, and then wait for everybody else to do a similar thing on some other piece. Uh, so I want, I want this more creative, a more forthcoming uh, paper from each of you. Yes? I'm sorry. For Sarah. No, that's right. No, you're okay. Good. <coughs> yes, Sarah. Should, we, should I talk about like, what I think the planet is going to be like once life for humans is impossible, yet like, isn't impossible? Like, yeah. is that, is that no, no, it's okay. Well, what, but, I, but I, do, I do want you, if you would, to put yourself into the equation. I mean, other than kind of a helpless observer. You know, like, like in uh, the fight game, sort of standing there on the 50th story of the building watching everything blow up and completely go to crap. You know, but that I, I, I want you to kind of put yourself into the drama and let me know what, if anything, you think you can do or are disposed to trying to do to, to stop the catastrophe. Uh, and, and if you really believe that you can't stop it, the question then is, what do you plan to do in response to that? Yeah. No, that's okay. If if you if you structure your paper in a in a way that's coherent and step by step like that, looking at various alternatives and weighing them out, etc., that that's a perfectly appropriate use of your intelligence and the information you've gotten in the course and the methodologies. And and but I, I do want you to to address this issue of the availability of all of the constitutional protections to in whatever state they happen to be now. Uh, in whatever state you think they may be going to be evolving to in the near future, of how it is that these can be utilized to attempt to intervene in this process or not. Okay? Now, ha having, having pointed out that I believe that a, a central uh, subcomponent element of this overall thesis is the existence of this cabal, if you will, uh, of this, this elite group that is uh, ruling from the shadows, uh, I do want to point out right at the very outset of this, uh, a few, these few periods where we're going to be discussing this thesis, that uh, I do not believe, I do not believe that these people that I'm talking about are the Illuminati. <laughs> you know, and it's not Queen Elizabeth uh, in combination with the Bilderbergers and the Carolingians that are, in fact, the secret bloodline of Jesus of Nazareth and Mary Magdalene. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not who I'm talking about uh, here. Uh, and secondly, it's not the 33rd degree Masons uh, that have been involved in some long-term conspiracy uh, to attempt to run the world and are, are the ones that are secretly responsible for putting the big eye above the pyramid on the back of the money. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't believe that either. 
Uh, and I don't believe that it is some sort of Jewish cabal, you know, that is the subject matter that was described in the Protocols of Zion, uh, that kind of rabidly anti-Semitic piece of trash that, uh, that was, was uh, uh, spun around for a long time in American history and purported to be true. Uh, and I also do not believe, and this may be a little bit more salient, I don't believe that it's the Jesuits, uh, or for that matter, even this Catholic papist conspiracy. I've, I've spent too much time around those people, uh, and I don't believe that they're engaged in this type of adverse activity. That's with, uh, with saying everything that one can say about the Vatican uh, in their history, in their, which I will talk about at some length, in their relationship with the fascists and their involvement in the, uh, in the uh, Odessa and the, the secret rat line of getting uh, fascist Nazis out of Europe and financing them secretly. I, I will talk about that. Uh, but I also don't believe that, uh, that this group of people are extraterrestrials from, you know, uh, from beta reticuli. I don't believe that they're reptilians that are walk-ins that have walked in and have taken over the former body of George H.W. Bush. Uh, I think he's entirely reptilian enough on his own. Uh, I, th I think that, you know, and there is, you know there, it's not Mikhail Gorbachev really as, as some uh, Palladian. Uh, you know, who is in dialectical confrontation with the, uh, the beta reticuli. I don't believe uh, any of that. And I don't believe that, uh, these, that there is a secret plan to uh, spread chemtrails around the, the world to turn the planet into a prehistoric jungle environment uh, for the reptilian uh, uh, ETs to come down and inhabit our planet because they've entered into some sort of a secret agreement with Eisenhower uh, shortly after the, uh, the events of 1947 at Roswell. Okay, I, so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to get those out of the way. Uh, uh, there is one more that I don't I think is uh, of this group. I don't think this is some group from inside the hollow earth uh, that was discovered by uh, Admiral Robert Byrd on some secret mission to the North Pole uh, back in May of 1947. That, uh, that in, in, in short, this is not one of those bizarre, absurd uh, conspiracy scenarios that, uh, that uh, some tiny group uh, of one or more uh, anal compulsives uh, have co completely fabricated and structured as a substitute for reality because they find reality too confusing. Uh, and it doesn't make enough sense to them. So what they've done is they've sat down and spent all of their time making up an artificial world that lends some sort of coherent meaning to them. Uh, by way of example, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, the, the classic, you know, of having fabricated this entire world uh, that has given rise to the Scientologists. Uh, this entire world that he's got going of this major confrontation between the, the beta reticuli and the, uh, the, the beings from, uh, from the, Ple the Pleiades, and he's worked up this entire theory about it. Uh, and and not, not by himself, because the fact is that the Mormons happen to believe the same thing. Uh, you know, so there, there are more widely respected uh, groups that, that uh, attach themselves to some peculiar uh, fantasies. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the Catholic Christian Church has a number of their own, uh, as, you, as you well know, as you all sort of came to realize by the time you got to be sophomores in college, that, uh, that those things that you were told uh, about angels, you know, s sitting on clouds with harps and all of that, that, those are not true. They're not literally true, at least. Okay, so, so I just wanted to make it clear that, uh, that this, uh, this thesis that I'm going to be talking about with you over the next few sessions uh, is not predicated upon the assumption that this elite oligarchical group that I'm talking about is any one of those half dozen uh, different conspiracy uh, groups. And so what I want to do today is I want to open on to this thesis by beginning uh, with the first premise, uh, and, and it isn't necessary to go into any great depth about this because we've covered it a, a few times, that is this issue of the global climate change. 
uh, that that uh, that as as you know the the, the most recent uh, global climate change report came out in November of 2014, and uh, and it and it uh, is has some extraordinarily frightening uh, predictions that have been made by the International Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations. Uh, it in fact is projecting. Uh, uh, sea, sea rise levels and uh, and uh, global mean temperature uh, rise levels uh, of uh, of disastrous proportions. Uh, they're, they're talking about a, a a four to five degree Fahrenheit rise in the global mean temperature between now and basically uh, 2100. Uh, many many scientists think that that's conservative. Uh, but that engenders a potential rise in the uh, in the mean global sea levels uh, from 10 to potentially 26 feet, uh, and that this causes the inundation of the sea coasts all around the world uh, up to a, a level, a period, uh, or a distance of almost 10 miles. And what they've discovered now is that with the inundation of the sea coast up to 10 miles, that it actually uh, invades the territory of, uh, it'll be almost 60% of the human family uh, by the year 2070. Okay, and that, and that it'll contaminate the water, the uh, underground aquifers uh, up to a, per, uh, a distance of 20 to 25 miles under the ground along the seacoast and that it will melt uh, both of the uh, the global ice caps you know eliminating uh, a third of all of the potential fresh drinking water on the planet uh, and eliminate another third in the aquifers that are contaminated by the, the global sea sea rise now and I, I also touched upon what is one of the sleepers in this, two of the sleepers in this, is that there are uh, some 400 private nuclear power plants located within that 10 mile uh, distance of the shorelines around the world. And that if those, if those facilities are inundated uh, by major tidal surges uh, in these increased storms, that you can have uh, hundreds of the Fukuyama uh, situations that we have in Japan right now, where virtually every single day there are a hundred people frantically going out of their mind all day long to keep that place from melting down, uh, right? As we sit here kind of casually without it being anywhere in the news. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that, that type of a situation uh, threatens to contaminate the, the seawaters around the world with radiation that would kill off the plankton at the very base of the food chain, thereby killing the entire food chain in the ocean. Uh, and, and the second major factor that we touched on before is that with the melting of the polar ice caps in the glacial fields uh, at, the, at the north and south poles of our, of our country, it would in fact release this fresh water, melted fresh water into the seas, lowering the salination levels of the sea and decreasing the density of the seawater, thereby causing the underwater sea currents to rise to the surface and dissipate. Yes, Seth? Did a government agency publish this report or when we published this? This is the International Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, okay? And so, that, so what, what, what I'm saying is, is that uh, people are failing to grasp the cataclysmic dimensions of what it is that's being uh, forecast uh, if the present rate of global greenhouse gas emissions uh, are not reduced. And back in 1992, in the first session uh, of the, the global climate change conferences, that it was projected that in the 1992 report that unless, unless the annual, the 1992 annual levels of global greenhouse gas emissions were reduced by 70% by the year 2020, that we would ab be absolutely wedded 
to this type of catastrophe. And the fact of the matter is that even today, the, uh, the proposals that are being made by the Obama administration is at most proposing the reduction of global greenhouse gas emissions by 17%, as distinct from 70%, and not by 2020, but only by 2050. And so you see, you see that what we're, what we're dealing with here uh, is very much analogous to the famous case of, uh, of, the, uh, of the wise King uh, David, I believe it was, that when the two women were arguing about who, whose baby, was Saul, King Saul, yeah, who, about who, whose baby this was, they brought the baby to him, and he said, okay, I know how to solve this, bring me my sword, and I'll cut the baby in half, and I'll give half of the baby to each of the two women. And when he got ready to do that, only one of the two women was willing to go along with that. And so he then knew who the real mother was and gave the child to the mother who said, no, don't do that. I'll give up the child and let the child live. Okay. And, and what we have here is we have people when confronted with this type of uh, death to, to tens of hundreds of thousands of people on our planet. Uh, all they do is start cutting things in half. And you say, okay, uh, I'm proposing a 70% reduction. Uh, okay, maybe uh, let's talk about 35. They don't even talk about 35. They're down at 17. Because it's a negotiating position, sort of like you're buying a house. Right? And, uh, and the fact of the matter is, the Republican Party in the House of Representatives won't even agree to 7% won't even agree to a 7% reduction in the global greenhouse gas emissions uh, by the year 2100 because they insist that it isn't true. And they, in fact, have hired the exact same people to make the public argument that global climate change is not true. They've hired the exact same people that they previously hired to say that, that smoking cigarettes will not give you cancer. The exact same people. Okay, yes. Do you think it's they truly believe that, they, that this will happen or that they're just trying to deny it? Uh, what, what it is, what it is, is they, the, the, the question is, do I believe that they really believe that this isn't going to happen or are they just saying that? I believe it's even worse than that. What happens is that because of the creation of this unique business model of a, of a corporation, as I've said a number of times, which in fact immunizes the owners of the shares of stock of the company and the recipients of the percentage of the profits of the company each year, that it immunizes them against any personal liability. And it immunizes the management of the plant from any personal liability. And it renders liable only the assets and resources of the corporation, which is usually set up as a limited liability corporation that has housed just a limited percentage of the assets to which they have access, okay? So that if in fact they're sued, there's a limited pool <laughs> of liability. And because of that, they actually have adopted in corporate law with all of their lawyers, self-servingly, they have adopted a, a policy which is, which is known as the doctrine of ultra viris. And the doctrine of ultra viris uh, mandates that any person who sits on the board of directors of a private for-profit corporation, if they engage in making a decision on behalf of the, 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 co the corporation that is motivated by anything other than maximizing the profits of the company and increasing the return that is going to be given to the owners of the shares, they can be dismissed for cause. So that if, in fact, they were to try to take into consideration the public interest or the health of the people downstream, as long as they could show that they didn't think that they were going to the company was going to be held liable for contaminating those people downstream, because their lawyers are going to be able to block any such liability, uh, if they tried to take it into account, then they'd be fired for cause. Okay. So what it is is that there's a structure that has been designed intentionally to immunize all of these people from any personal liability 
and they at the same time are completely dependent for their continued employment by that corporation to be only taking into account how to maximize the profits of the company. And so what they've done is they've canceled out of the equation any type of human concern. And that shouldn't be surprising because the corporation has no soul. And the, so the, their own individual soul, the question you might ask is, well, does that mean that their own individual soul stops functioning as a source of, uh, of uh, a conscious moral ethic of any kind? The answer is yes. That's exactly right. They are commanded to stop doing that. You know, stop doing that. Stop interfering with what we're doing here by raising those kind of concerns. They're, they're ultra varies. They're outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. Okay? So that, yes. They understand that, like, I understand that they're in guys and that it's like a structured system and that they're safe within it and that they can keep getting money and ruin the world and that makes sense. But, like, do you think they actually have no understanding of, like, like, I'm sure, like, they're not going to willingly admit that they're ruining the world, but do you think they have, like, absolutely no, like, unconscious or like conscious thought of like what 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 it's like is it's it's not part of their consideration and so it's as simple as that is if if you have if you have a system where you have six things that you have to think about in your capacity in this position and you direct your attention to all six of them and that ain't on the list it just doesn't get paid attention to I did the I did the deposition of uh, of uh, uh, Dean McGee, who was the owner, uh, the co-owner of the Kerr McGee Nuclear Corporation, where Karen Silkwood worked. And as I said, Robert S. Kerr was the Kerr of Kerr McGee. Robert S. Kerr was the four-time governor of the state of Oklahoma and the four-time United States senator, and was the chairman of the Senate Armed Service Committee. Uh, he was second in power only to Lyndon Johnson in the United States Senate. And he had built right in his former congressional district, when he was a congressman, he had this big nuclear plant built, uh, a privately uh, owned for-profit uh, corporation, which was going to be reprocessing the spent nuclear fuels from the other nuclear facilities, the 103 nuclear facilities, power plants around the country. And when I was taking his deposition, uh, just as, as, as kind of a, uh, a little uh, mental exercise, I said to him, I said, look, can you tell me uh, when you were talking with uh, Robert Kerr about this idea of potentially uh, having a company that was going to be reprocessing spent nuclear fuel, tell me what the kind of considerations were that you engaged in, uh, in, in considering undertaking that kind of a business. And he looked at me kind of puzzled like, and then he turned on his B-school hat, you know, and he started going down. Well, we had to think about how much the, the structure was going to cost. We had to figure out how much the, the materials were going to cost, how we were going to get shipped the materials here. And he, he went on this big, long list. I sat there and waited for him <clears throat> to exhaust his imagination in remembering all of the things that he had to take into account. I sat there for a full half hour and just pushed him and showed him to keep on thinking of more things. And he got to the very end and couldn't think of anything else. And I said, what about the health and safety of the people who work there? And there was this big, complete, kind of dead look in his eyes, like, why would I have thought about that? You know, and, and I'm trying to tell you that, that it wasn't that he was intellectually incapable of thinking of that. It's just that he had not thought about it. And it wasn't in the scope of things because they, as long as they didn't have to pay for the people, uh, they didn't care. And they had workman's compensation. So that if a person got a full body burden and would be wedded to cancer, you know, they could get, you know, $53, you know, for the loss of their life, you know, or $120 for one lung. You know, I mean, that which they've put into place that the entire owners of the corporations have lobbied the United States Congress in under the color of putting in a system which was purportedly for the benefit of the workers, because that way they would avoid having to file a lawsuit and go to all the expenses of suing the company to get paid the real value of the damage that had been inflicted upon them at the workplace. They were given an alternative system that would pay them like $120 for the loss of a leg, you know, or $200 for the loss of your right arm if you were right-handed. 
you know, and a hundred dollars if you're left-handed, <laughs> you know, and and so that so that, and then they said you should be happy with that, because we have uh, in, in our, our our patronizing way saved you the whole problem of having to hire a lawyer and go and sue the company. This is a sure thing. You'll get it as a sure thing, you know. Uh, so so what I'm saying is that this this concept of the corporation that came into place uh, shortly after the Civil War in the United States and crafted this new model of doing business uh, not only generated the immunization of the owners of the stock, i.e. the owners of the company, and the management, and the members of their board of directors, and limited the total degree of liability solely to the assets that were officially in <clears throat> the, the coffers of that particular uh, corporation, what it, what it, uh, what it, uh, what it, all, what it also did, interestingly enough and very importantly, it created uh, a new financial instrument. It, it uh, created a share of stock. Remember, I touched on that. In the, if in fact the corporation owned a million dollars of assets and they had a million shares of stock, each one of those shares of stock was worth one dollar. It represented a, a uh, one millionth of the, the assets of the whole company. And so if the, owner, if the main owner owned 53% of all of those, he owned 53% of all the assets of the company, in effect. But what happens if, if someone, some enterprising young entrepreneur, <coughs> thought that the company next year was going to be worth $2 million, he would come to the person who has the stock, uh, and it's, a, it's for like a dollar a share, he would offer that person $1.50 a share. And to say that uh, I'll, I'll pay you $1.50 of that stock that you have, it's a dollar a share, I'll pay you $1.50 a share, and that way he would talk them into selling it to him, and that way he, for $1.50 a share, would own shares of stock, which in the short while would be worth $2. And so what they did is they designed a new financial instrument that was subject totally to speculation, of speculating about what the increased value of the company was going to be like. And then they got into swapping and selling these shares of stock completely independent about any type of forecast relating to that company. They simply got into dealing with them like in a card game. Now, and it now as you know, they've invented computers that can buy and sell shares of stock in one one thousandth of a second. What they do is they purchase, a, 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 as soon as they get wind of the fact that someone is making a bid uh, through normal procedures to buy a certain number of shares of stock so that the demand for those shares of stock will go up and the value of the stock will go up incrementally. As soon as they get wind that someone is in the process of trying to buy it, they flash in and purchase 10,000 shares of it. And then as soon as that other person puts the bid in and the price goes up, they sell them. Having absolutely nothing to do with the value of the company or anything. It's just complete detachment from reality. Uh, and it's into it's in finances that they're so so that was another thing that was done with the creation of this new business model of the corporation. It created a new financial instrument. So that what happened is the owners of the majority of the stock in one of these corporations joined together with owners of other majority shares of stock in other companies, and they all started forming these investment houses. That's what they called it. It was an investment house. They would actually come to the same place, literally sit down at a table together and say, look, uh, we've got all this money. We own all these different shares of stock. What we can do is we can sell off a, a, a limited number of the shares of our individual stock, still maintaining complete control of the company that the stock relates to, and we can use that cash to buy up controlling interest in other corporations. And that what we can do is we can collectively own those other corporations. And so what we can do is start to assemble their business in a way that is benefiting all of our other corporations. And they start building these horizontal and vertical monopolies over entire areas of the economy. And this is exactly what happened in that period from 1868 to 1898. I'm talking about a 30-year period. A 30-year period, just like the period of time we're talking about now, between now, you know, 2015 and 2045. 
You know, in a short period of time, just like that, what they what they did is they generated this entire robber baron era of, of reckless financing in, in, in a monopoly control over various areas of the of the resources in the country. And so that that uh, that what's happened is that that this is the group of people that are making the kind of decisions that are passing off the costs to their company by passing them on to the public by saying we're going to my company is going to be uh, uh, running this big factory and it's going to be pumping the the uh, the bilge of, of waste materials and carbon uh, waste up into the atmosphere off into the atmosphere and all of that contamination and costs are going to rain down on everybody else and we don't have to cover that so what they've done is they've offloaded the costs of doing business uh, and one of those costs is the damage to the climate and, and you've probably seen some of these uh, gross pictures of, of you know Duke Power you know down in Virginia in, in West Virginia and you're tearing off the entire top third of a mountain in, in gouging out all of the coal and then pouring chemicals into the coal to get the remaining coal out of there and then letting all that poisonous uh, materials just run off down the mountain and kill off streams and, and, and plant life and wildlife, etc. And they don't care. Then they just pack up and leave and leave us sitting there. You know, and that's passing off all of those costs onto the public. Now, you would assume that the government should turn around and say, wait a second, you can't do that. You can't, you can't just dump your crap up on, on everybody else and walk away. You're responsible for cleaning all that up. But no, because the corporation goes in and pays campaign contributions to the local state legislators and says, I want you to pass a statute that says I don't have to clean it up. And they go ahead and pass the statute. <clears throat> and he gives them, you know, $10,000 for the next campaign. You know, and well, somebody should make that illegal. You know, but they, they, go, you go, they go to the people that would normally make that illegal and say, oh, we want you to pass a law saying that that's not illegal for the legislature to do that. Yeah, because they know what they're doing because they've got lawyers. They've got lawyers and the lawyers know where to go and they know what buttons to push and they know who to bribe. And that's, and that's what they do. And so that the, the, the first premise of the, uh, the overall thesis that, uh, that I've articulated to you uh, is that this global climate change is extremely real. Uh, it is, it is uh, pending at the moment. It is in the process of, of wreaking havoc on the planet. Uh, you see every, virtually every single night, if you watch what passes for news, you know, you can, you can see the reports of massive tornadoes uh, all through uh, uh, Oklahoma and Texas, massive floods everywhere, droughts in California of unprecedented uh, scale, you know, uh, huge floods in Vermont, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and huge freezing uh, blizzards coming down from the North Pole all the way down across Chicago and all the way through the Northeast that go on for weeks. You know, in, in Buffalo, you know, New York getting like, you know, 20, Boston getting like 16 feet of snow, you know, and, and everybody goes, oh, gee, this is pretty remarkable. You know, uh, it must have something to do with that global warming stuff, you know, and then that's it. And so what I'm saying is that the first premise of this thesis, the sub premise is that this global climate change is, in fact, substantial. It is happening now. And it is, in fact, being proximately caused by these corporations uh, that are, in fact, putting out the global greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and bribing the state legislatures and federal legislature to allow them to do that. Uh, and they're doing so knowingly. And, and they, they just aren't even computing it in as a legitimate consideration for them. Okay? So, so that's, the, that's uh, one of the first premises. And... But as I say, that on the other end of, the, of this spectrum on this thing is I do not believe at this stage that, there is, uh, that, that, it is, that we have reached the tipping point. There is this tipping point that is talked about, and uh, Sophia asked and mentioned about this, that the, the bottom line is that all of these experts understand 
that there's going to come a point in time when so much of, this, uh, of these pollutants have been put up into the atmosphere that even if you shut it off completely the next day, there's enough into the system already functioning that is going to work its way through the system and cause this catastrophe. And that one of the, one of the major uh, uh, cascading events that they're concerned about is the, uh, the increasing in the temperatures uh, in the, the northern Arctic, in Antarctica. And what it's doing is it's melting uh, the frozen uh, <coughs> moisture in the tundra. And that frozen moisture in the tundra has been locking in below it billions and billions of tons of deadly methane gas that in fact has been generated by the, by the, uh, the uh, rotting of the foliage that was there on the planet when those were jungles. Uh, from millions of years ago and so that there's billions of tons of this this methane and when in fact the tundra uh, melts the the uh, permafrost melts that 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 methane is going to come shooting up in big geysers into the atmosphere and it is 20 times more damaging with regard to uh, being a global greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide uh, and the, they're concerned that if that process starts, that could so accelerate all of the consequences of global uh, climate change that we wouldn't be able to stop it. Once that started, it, it would just be rolling down. Matthew and then Noah. So do you think that's like why there's uh, an increase in interest of like exploration of other planets? So like, what the, do you think the, the plan is to ignore that trash this planet and then move on to another planet? No, I, I, I don't. I, th I think that the impetus for, for space exploration and stuff came initially from the Cold War uh, of trying to get the high ground, uh, uh, as General Graham called it, to, <clears throat> to get the ultimate high ground uh, so they can get a we can get a base on the moon before the Soviets do and we can fire down from the moon, and, and et cetera. <clears throat> and the, and the, there is, of course, a good deal of genuine scientific uh, uh, imagination involved in interplanetary uh, exploration. Uh, I don't think they had that kind of long-range view of it. Uh, but I do know that, that rather than putting their ingenuity into figuring out a way to stop the global greenhouse gas emissions, what they're trying to do is do all of this additional fundraising uh, and money making by, by uh, geo, geo planning. That they, they got all the kind of geoengineering plans of potentially building gigantic dikes and stuff all around the shorelines uh, to keep the water from coming in and inundating the areas. And so that way we just make more money on it. You know, uh, let's just make more money. Uh, and so that they're, they're, they are turning their attention away from trying to solve it uh, by just trying to figure out how to make more money on it, you know, but it's, I don't think that's what's motivating the space exploration. Noah? Um, there was a National Geographic last year that had like 10 possibilities for how they could stop uh, climate change. Yeah. Some of them were pretty ridiculous. One of them was like, we're going to shoot a million mirrors at the sun. But I'm wondering, at a certain point, would the corporations everywhere need to like, wouldn't they think like, oh, we need to like, stop this so we can keep making money because if the world ends we're all going to die like at a certain point wouldn't it be like it's in our best interest to invest in uh some kind of cure you know? well the, you you would think so uh, but but the the reality is that the corporation collectively doesn't think that way that the corporation just thinks about being able to make more money the next quarter because that's how it's engineered it's designed to do that and so the, it doesn't think in terms of the extremely long range uh, uh, requirements for the company. The question about the individuals, uh, what they end up doing is they build gated communities. They build gated communities and hire armed guards and stuff and keep people out. And then they, they, they have these uh, beautiful watered lawns and everything else inside their compounds. And, uh, and then they drive, they drive to the, the company headquarters in armored vehicles. You know, and uh, and go back and forth that way, and, and they don't they don't worry about the the long term consequences. So that the, the most corporations do not have adequately long term uh, plans. Okay, yes.
have the ability to at least make in communities biospheres where you could survive in that, and you could make money off of that. You could sell oxygen once it becomes an actual thing you could bottle and sell to people. Well, as you, you remember, we talked about Bolivia the other day, where in fact Bechtel did exactly that. Bechtel purchased the public water company. Uh, down there in Cuchamanga, and uh, and then raise the raise the rates 35 uh, percent, and then pass statutes prohibiting you from gathering your own rainwater. Uh, you know, so that there it isn't that they don't do any type of of f future thinking, <laughs> but their future thinking is pretty much limited to how to increase their profits. You know, uh, yes, uh, uh, Tyler. What role do you think the American consumer has in contributing to the process of globalization or like modernization? Oh yeah. Oh, there's no doubt about that. The, the, but the, but the, the fact the fact of the matter is that the the uh, when we when we talk about the average consumer, we're talking about the average American, the average level of education, the average level of understanding about political realities, which is not very high. And and so what you what you find is that the the consumer is subjected to a thing almost like neuro linguistic programming. Where they, they actually keep going. In, in fact, they just had a thing on. I was I was working on the the notes here for the talk the other night, and uh, and Sarah had the television on, and they were it was like an MTV thing, and they were talking about how the how the uh, uh, Trident Gum, tri the Trident Gum Company had uh, had figured out a way to get young teenage kids to participate in advertising their bubble gum for them without paying them. Uh, and what they would do is they would they would uh, they would hook up with the movie the uh, uh, what's that movie about the flame, the, uh, uh, the 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 young girl that was in the game when they would kill the Hunger Games thing, and the, what they were doing is they were they were awarding uh, teenagers an additional flame, a, a complete virtual reward of they were giving them a little flame uh, in their in their portfolio. Uh, for uh, for having reported to, into the company, you know what the songs were that uh, they and their friends were listening to the previous day. So then the Trident on their little MTV television show could in fact play music by those people. Uh, and if, if they for every for every ten names they gave them, they would win another flame. And and you could hear these kids being interviewed how excited they were about getting another flame. Uh, and it didn't mean anything at all, you know. And so the, the, the consumers can, in fact, be, be propagandized, can be uh, manipulated by, by professionals uh, that are full-scale professionals in psychology and neuro-linguistic programming and other kind of disciplines as to how to stimulate people into doing things that have absolutely nothing to do with their own best interests. And so what's happened is that they, they, these major corporations view the consumers simply as a, function, a, a factor in their sales process of how they get them to buy more goods. Now, the, the back end question and the one that, that Roosevelt raised was, look, if, you, if the corporations don't take care to at least pay their workers an adequate salary, they aren't gonna have enough money to purchase the products and then they won't be able to be consumers. So there's a balance that they have to strike there. Uh, and and uh, and so that uh, what what I what I wanted to do is is take a look at the next the next issue, which is the next sub uh, the, uh, sub element of the thesis, and that is that there is a conscious rolling into place of the protocols, procedures, and programs of a United States centered, uh, not centered in the United Nations yet but still centered in the United States of a major national security state, uh, bureaucracy, uh, utilizing the National Security Act of 1947, uh, the, the Patriot Act that we're quite familiar with, uh, and the various National Defense Authorization Acts from 2006 all the way through 2012, as well as a, an ultra-secret program that is known as the Continuity of Government uh, Program. Uh, and that, that this is a, a secret program that was designed uh, by the, the, uh, the Pentagon in saying that, look, what happens when we have a nuclear war? Not if. I remember Terry, uh, Terry, Steichen, Terry Steichen, who was the, uh, the 
he was the science and technology and communications director for the White House Office on Telecommunications Policy back in 1979. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was there in 1981 when Reagan and his people came into office. And uh, he told me that they, as, the, as the White House Office on Telecommunications Policy Director, he would be called to these monthly meetings that they would have about how they were going to respond to a nuclear attack. If the United States was subject to a major nuclear attack, how were they going to go about reestablishing the communication systems and how are they going to deal with the communication systems with all of those pulse uh, explosions going off, et cetera. And he told me one afternoon, we were sitting talking, and he said that he was sitting in one of these meetings and they, they, with all the generals and everybody else that come to these meetings, maybe about 30 guys in, at the, at the uh, White House, and they, they took a break uh, for a smoke break because most, most of them smoked. Uh, and so they, they go outside, and uh, he was standing outside next to this big four-star general, and, uh, and Terry said that he was getting this really creepy feeling uh, since the Reagan Bush administration had come in and replaced the Carter administration. Uh, and uh, he, turned, he turned to this four-star general and he said, uh, uh, I, I've been getting this kind of creepy feeling uh, since the administration changed uh, when I come to these meetings. And I can't quite put my finger out. Do, do you have that same feeling? And the general said, well, yes, I do. I, I do have that same feeling. And Terry said, what do you think it is? And the guy said, I've thought about this a lot. And he said, I realize that uh, since the Reagan and Bush administration came in, uh, they're not talking about if a nuclear war happens. They're talking about when a nuclear war happens. That they are planning for a nuclear war to take place. And they're actually planning on how to win one of these things. Uh, and and it, it, he was so thunderstruck by that realization that that's exactly what it was that was going on, that he was freaking out. And when, then he found out that they had established in the Pentagon, in response to this new mentality, a continuity of government program. And that is, how were they going to reconstitute the federal government uh, if Washington, D.C. was hit with, you know, a, a 15 kiloton nuclear bomb and killed, you know, virtually all the Congress and, and killed the president, vice president? You know, what were they, how, what were they going to do? And so what they did is they, they began to set up a, uh, a backup government, a, a system whereby they had chains of command all delineated. And if the people above you in the chain of command had all been killed off, then you would, in fact, ascend to being in charge of that organization. And so that what, what they had done is the, the uh, colonels in all, all four of the military services began to look for the people that were all down at a certain level, uh, down the chain of command, and started to organize them as though they were really the government. And that they began to conduct themselves in secret, just as though they were the government. And they started designing alternative legislation. They started uh, formulating alternative policies uh, that were, were ones that they agreed with. And so what they did is they began to form an actual shadow government uh, in our country, inside the national security state apparatus. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a group that, uh, that uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North was part of, as was, as was Don, Rumfeld, Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. <coughs> And that they had been part of this thing for, for decades. And even when they were no longer officials in the government, they remained in the continuity of government planning group. Even when, for example, Cheney was the executive uh, director of, uh, what was the company? The, Halliburton. Yeah, Halliburton. Okay. And so here he is, the, the CEO of Halliburton, sitting on the shadow government committee, making alternative plans for the government, 
over and distinct from the plans that the Congress and the executive branch and the official government were making. Uh, so so I, I, I want you to understand that there is this rolling into place that this, uh, this uh, mysterious appearance of all of this military equipment and stuff in, in, uh, in Santa Cruz and across all the other cities in Ferguson and in other cities across the, the country is not coincidental. As, uh, as Franklin Roosevelt once said, you can be sure that anything that happens in politics is not a mistake. It's been planned by somebody. Okay? And, and that's what's happening here. Because uh, what, I, what I'm asserting is that, that this national security state apparatus is actually being utilized by a pre-existing that is pre-1947 existing, before the National Security Act of 1947 that created the CIA and the NSA and all of those other, uh, other government agencies, that, that, that this national security state apparatus is now being utilized by a consciously created, consciously coordinated uh, alliance or confederation of certain families, of certain families that exist in the United States and that have for years uh, been majority stockholder owners uh, of the major corporations that we're talking about. You know, and, uh, and we're going to be addressing some of those particular families. There's obviously the Bush family, the Rockefeller family, uh, J.P. Uh, Morgan uh, uh, family that owns the Morgan Guarantee Trust. The Rockefeller is the Chase Manhattan Bank and, and Standard Oil of New Jersey. There's a certain limited number of families uh, whose uh, patriarchs sit on a council as partners uh, in the private investment firm of Brown Brothers Harriman. And they're actually represented as a group by the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Uh, and Sullivan and Cromwell represents those men individually in their private lives as well. And that this is a cabal uh, that, that owns the controlling interest in a whole series of major corporations and banks and private investment houses uh, and financial institutions in the country. Uh, and that they, in fact, are the ones, many of them, who own the banks that make up the Federal Reserve System, that actually prints the money. Uh, that is used by the United States, which represents notes, their, their uh, credit notes, uh, that actually represent the debt that is owed by the federal government to the Federal Reserve Banks. Uh, and that this has been now adopted as the official currency and legal tender uh, in the United States. Uh, and so what, what I'm going to be doing uh, over the period of the next two, three uh, meetings together is elucidating the history and the activities of these particular people and the, the, the form in which is manifest at the present time uh, in, in uh, groups like the Carlisle Group uh, in Bechtel and uh, it was uh, Kellogg, Brown and Root and a number of the other uh, companies to say nothing about uh, Blackwater uh, which goes through many permutations of different names and they're trying to figure out like maybe people won't notice they're still there. Uh, but you know, it's a, it's a major private military power. Uh, and in fact, they own tanks, armored personnel carriers, full battalions, uh, F-15 fighter jets uh, owned by this private uh, security company at, that hire out to major corporations so that they can crush uh, any resistance in foreign countries to the, the moving into that country of like shell oil into Nigeria uh, and any of the local indigenous population that tries to resist them pumping sludge out into their home territories uh, are quelled by a full battalion of, the, of these people flying in on uh, helicopter gunships uh, and uh, in wasting those people. So uh, that's what I, I wanted uh, to start with, 
to let you know where we're going to be going here in the next few uh, meetings together because I'm going to set forth this thesis about this group of people and what they've been doing behind the scenes, the kind of policies that they're, they're doing, and how it is that they're responsible for the massive global climate change, which we see happening, and why it is that they're going to be utilizing the tools of the national security state to quell any type of effective organizing to try to stop what it is they're doing through constitutional and lawful channels. Uh, therefore, confronting us all with the question of what to do when, in fact, the normal, peaceful channels of social change are cut off through criminal conduct on the part of this cabal of people. Okay? So that, that uh, the, we, we have time for starting the question session here, our Thursday question session. We'll, we'll go till quarter of... And then what we'll do is we'll go over uh, to, uh, to uh, the other room and we'll have our, our, uh, our section meeting, okay? So I, I know there have been questions popping up as we've been going along, and that's good for people to be spontaneous. But I'm sure that there are some additional questions that you have uh, that are just sitting there ruminating now. I may have frightened everybody. Yes, Tomas. No, that's, all, that's all true. That, that uh, you'll, you'll notice that on Monday, uh, we mentioned it on Tuesday in class, on Monday, uh, uh, President Obama signed an executive order prohibiting the sale of certain types of military equipment to the local police around the country. This was necessary because there has developed an entire program that has been going on over the past 10 years. Uh, now, uh, 12 years uh, of, of selling at extremely low uh, levels uh, military equipment that has been produced by American corporations for profit, uh, being paid huge amounts of money for, those, for that military equipment that was being made available for the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And as the Obama administration moved a number of the military forces out of, uh, of the Middle East, they've been continuing to produce and sell more military equipment to the, to the different governments, to the Iraqi government and uh, to the various forces, if they can figure out which one is fighting whom. Uh, they'll, they'll, and if they can't figure it out, they'll sell military equipment to both of them. Uh, and, and, but that they've produced so much of this stuff that they have excess military equipment now. And so what they've started to do is to sell this equipment at extremely low discount rates to police departments. And the, the, the uh, equipment is being paid for by grants from the Homeland Security Department that is sending uh, these, uh, these uh, one-way grants to the police departments uh, that, that can be used solely for purchasing a particular piece of equipment. Uh, and one of these that's just come up was the Bearcat here in <coughs> Santa Cruz. That, uh, that there was a, 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 a grant offered by the Homeland Security Department. Uh, first, the first grant uh, that came in was for the surveillance cameras uh, for the photographing of the license plates uh, and photographing the, res the, the uh, passengers in automobiles at random all around the city. There were a whole, I don't know what the number of these cameras were, but there are a dozen of them or so, and that they'd be placed randomly around the city and that they would be photographing every single license plate and car that drove past the site. And that they would at the same time photograph all the people that were in the car. The same technology they use for those deadly red light things. You know, if you, you go through the red light and it flashes a picture and takes a picture of your license plate and you driving in the car, and they, they've used this technology now for taking photographs of cars all the time, everywhere, every car, wherever they're going in the city. And then they send the photographs of the, re the participants in the car, or the passengers, and the license plates up to a 
Homeland Security uh, Center up in San Francisco where they store all of the information there and all of that information is available to regular law enforcement officers. Uh, so if they want to know where you were driving your car you know on uh, May 21st of 2015 in Santa Cruz they simply uh, query that computer system and that data comes out of there and they give they cough up all of the pictures of everybody that was in the car with you in the exact time and place and how long you spent there and uh, who was with you etc and uh, and so what what happened is that because of all the the trouble that happened in Ferguson and the people rising up in Ferguson against the local police and the local police then resorting to rolling out all of their heavy artillery uh, their big bear cats and their 50 caliber machine guns you know mounted on there in the, it, it was a, a full-scale occupation military force uh, uh, suited out and equipped just like as if they were in Fallujah you know uh, and in many of the same people the people that are hired for the police departments are a lot of the same people that have been trained in the military to occupy uh, foreign hostile territory and in fact they were able to pick up some of the the email communications going on inside the police department they were referring to the people in the community in Ferguson as the enemy that we have to be able to corral the enemy and put them in and, and keep them keep track of them etc they, they were using straight up military tactics that had been devised for foreign occupation for our local communities but what happened is because of all the the bad publicity shall we call it uh, that arose around what was going on in Ferguson the administration felt that it was necessary to kind of get out in front of it with a little PR blast and so what they did is they said uh, oh, it was so bad, all this heavy military equipment being rolled out that what we're going to do is we're going to prohibit uh, certain kinds of that material being made available. And people went, oh, that sounds good. Well, what they were really prohibiting was uh, uh, military tracked vehicles. If, in fact, they had the big metal uh, tank treads on them, you know, like the armored personnel carriers, the half tracks, they call them. You know, the, the only thing that they prohibited is if they had metal half tracks. You know, not the not the Bearcat, <clears throat> and and they they also banned full 50 caliber machine guns. You know, that shoot a slug the size of your hand. You know, and blow whole chunks of people away if it hits them. You know, I mean, they they actually outlawed 50 caliber weapons to be used against civilian populations. You know, I mean, you can shoot a hole right through an engine block. You know, one of those things. And so what they did is, they, and, and that's all that they've done. They've kind of shaved off some of the more extreme edges of the kind of equipment that they were. So they, they can't have grenade launchers, for example, uh, you know, or probably anti-aircraft <laughs> weapons. You know, and so they've trimmed off some of the edges and are trying to foist it off on the consumers, as it were, uh, the regular people, as a big reform. Uh, and so everybody can go, oh, a sigh of relief. You know, they're not going to be running over me with a half track. Uh, it'll only be a bear cat, you know, and so so that's what's happening right now. And so that given the fact that the administration is responsive to that kind of public pressure, motivates people to put more pressure on them and try to cut back more on that. And of course, and what it does is it causes the right wing Republicans in the House to argue not to give in on anything, because if you give in on anything, then you've lost the principle. Uh, and then who knows? It's a slippery slope. You know, they may they may be without howitzers before long you know so so that's that's I didn't mean to be too long-winded about that Sarah um, is there any place where you can where it would tell us where there's the cameras that are taking pictures of cars it's interesting that there was a, there was an effort on the part of some of the people to find out where they were planning to put those and uh, they <clears throat> the police asserted that it was national security that they weren't going to tell where they were because they were doing it under the auspices of the Homeland Security and they were providing the information of the Homeland Security people so therefore they invoked national security for you know refusing to tell us in our own community where they were putting the cameras you know <clears throat> so that this this whole importation of national security secrecy over things into our own hometowns over things like that because they would say to you <clears throat> what difference does it make for you why do you want to know what do you plan to do you know, are you going to try to ruin the ruin the cameras? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> you know, or or reroute your 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 driving so you don't go by these things. You know, that's defeating the whole purpose of this. 
<clears throat> so they, they aren't going to tell you, you know. So let's let's uh, let's go on over. Let's go on over to our uh, our earlier shop, and then we can uh, have a full scale discussion of these things.